Now, inaugurations are fairly awkward affairs. You get speeches from losing primary candidates interspersed with diamond-clad pop stars singing songs about social justice. But much of the world still tuned in to watch Joe Biden be sworn in as US president. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you, God. So help me, God. Congratulations, Mr. Thank President. You. So, Naomi, I want to bring you in for, you know, for the first question. Do you think there's any chance that Joe Biden, you know, himself actually intends to be quite a progressive president, potentially more progressive than he has been in his past political career? I don't think he has a choice. I think uh, the speech was almost intentionally vague, given the attacks of, of on the Capitol by white supremacists uh, two weeks ago today. I think that they had an intention to, quote unquote, unify the country, however you do that. Uh, it's I don't know how you can unify with white supremacists, but perhaps he's trying to pull some of the more reasonable Republicans who uh, were embarrassed by what happened and didn't want to be included in that party. Maybe that was his goal. But I think that the crises of the moment, which he did identify, uh, obviously, there we've now hit 400,000 deaths. Uh, due to the COVID in the last year in this country, actually not even in the last year. Uh, we have a healthcare system that is basically non-existent unless you have access to money or have money yourself. Um, not to mention the housing crisis that we're not even aware of yet uh, and the mass evictions that we're just postponing, postponing attached to debt uh, for people who you know are still going to have to pay their past rents over the last 10 months. Um, and, you know, we now have working people that were already underpaid and dealing with this economic system. But uh, I think that we're going to have a lot more working poor people in this country or just non-working, unemployed poor people in this country uh, that he has to deal with. And there's no way out of that unless you come up with bold solutions. I do think there was a way for him to address these crises and also be inclusive of of folks who might not be open to more socialist ideas, uh, quote unquote socialist ideas. I think he could have come up with his form of a new deal uh, that, that talks to working people on whatever side of the aisle, however they want to channel their frustrations due to the economic problems in our country. Uh, I think his job is to channel it into something productive that uh, heals the wounds of America that are coming out in the most horrific ways. Um, I didn't see that. And that's what disappointed me is that I, I, I do think, you know, this is somebody who who talked so much about labor, talked so much about being working class Joe from Scranton, Pennsylvania, factory town, a former factory town. But I haven't heard other than saying that we should not be focused on the deficit, which was something we haven't heard from neoliberals in the last 35 years. Um, other than that, I, I really haven't heard much about how labor can be a part of this project to heal America. And I don't think there's a path without having labor, even if it's a dying labor force. I don't think there's a path. Um, because keep in mind, so many workers in this country have been on the front lines, and many of them are women, and many of them are women of color. In fact, in fact, most women have dealt with the worst aspects of this economy. And other than talking about white supremacy, which transformative that he addressed it publicly, just as it was transformative when Cori Bush said white supremacist in chief it was still very surface level. And I do think that there is a way to unify the country while still healing our economic uh, wounds uh, that just was not dealt with in the speech, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, it, there, there was less concrete promises than I was expecting. You know, the, the most optimistic takes about Biden is that he could, you know, without really meaning to be sort of forced into the position of a kind of FDR who has to come up with some kind of new deal. And he very much there was just channeling, look, Trump's gone. We can go back to normal, which is very much, you know, what I, what I took from from everything he said really up on stage. 
Yeah, and you know, it's it's strange is because just a few days ago, uh, he did give a speech about his plans for the first 100 days. And while well, it was imperfect, by far better than we've ever heard from him. I mean, just that deficit line alone, recognizing that we should not frame every single policy from the point of how are we going to pay for it? And will it, it, will it worsen the deficit? He acknowledged that they made crucial errors in the post-economic collapse of 2008 in the Obama administration, and he didn't want to take that path because they were dealing from a place of, well, the deficit could get worse, and and how are we going to pay for it? Uh, so he he... It was almost like Stephanie Kelton or the leaders of MMT were in his ears and, and said, you know, you can always print more money. There's nothing. Don't worry. <laughs> um, especially if you're the was, United States, right? Right. Especially for the United States. The country which, where which, MMT which, really works. Exactly. Exactly. And unfortunately, um, this is the speech that history is going to look back on. Most likely it won't be the speech from four days ago. So I almost wish she gave the speech from four days ago today and added in the healing of America uh, and ridding the country of white supremacy. What was actually interesting is the most dangerous terms he could have used that would could prevent you know, partnering with the Republicans was the term white supremacy. That's the trigger for so many Republicans because whether they acknowledge the actions on Capitol Hill last week or two weeks ago were forms of white supremacy or anti-Semitism or misogyny, or not. I think there are, we're not at the stage yet where enough Republicans recognize that's not the party that they signed up for. Maybe they just don't want, they want to pay more taxes, whatever. I mean, there are plenty of Republicans who become Republicans for different reasons, but may not be able to connect the dots between, you know, economic systems built off of slavery, misogyny, and those lower taxes. But we have to get them there. And I think the pathway through that is really tapping into the economic divides and the, uh, the, the the crises of healthcare and wages and housing that the majority of Americans are facing right now. I suppose what's remarkable when you listen to American politicians is they all sound ridiculous in the way they talk about the USA, you know, either as the last great hope or the, the leading force for good in the world. And, you know, whilst, you know, they think they're sounding internationalist when they say that for many people, you know, across the world, they're actually like clenching their teeth because like, oh, maybe the one the one redeeming factor about Donald Trump was this kind of isolationism. Now you've got a, a liberal, a Democrat in, in office who's going to try and regain the mantle of world leadership. Is that something we should be really worried about? It's a super interesting question. Um, I think I, I want to sort of say at the beginning of this, I think actually the situation right now in the United States is incredibly volatile. And that's not really captured by what you're seeing with the State of the Union address. And um, Aristotle in The Politics talks about the need for majesty. And he says, you don't have political authority without majesty. And so what you're seeing with people who, who's basically, their takes on Biden and the renewal of America on the basis of Lady Gaga singing a song is basically the power of majesty. It makes people into babbling idiots who are talking complete nonsense. And the same problems which confronted America before Donald Trump, during Donald Trump, will remain. One of them is, like you say, related to foreign policy. Can America remain the world's policeman? No. Does Joe Biden have the sort of political legitimacy, the social base whereby you can see wars abroad to maintain American imperium? No. Is there a clearly now a massive isolationist uh, sort of bent within both the Republican Party, but also the sort of Democratic Party on the left? Yes, that's probably a social majority actually against American misadventures abroad. So he has major problems there. And finally, in sort of replying to something that Miki said about he has no choice, Joe Biden wins in November last year. I mean, he was always going to win the, the popular vote, but he wins the presidency fundamentally because of African-Americans. Now, people might think, well, how's that possible? Trump increased his share of African-Americans and Latinos on four years earlier. But it's because we see record numbers of people participating. You know, the, 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 the turnout by one measure in this election was, I think, the highest in more than 100 years. And you see this particularly after the murder of George Floyd. I think in Georgia, Republicans actually, the state of Georgia, Republicans were actually registering people uh, to a greater extent than, than Democrats were until the death of George Floyd. And so that's, a, that's an inflection point. That's a turning point. Now, that's not to say that sort of BLM can tell Joe Biden what to do because it's not that kind of a movement. It's not that organized. But the people that voted for Joe Biden 
and actually didn't tend to vote for the Democrats as much down ballot, th those people don't want American wars abroad. They don't believe in American exceptionalism sort of overtly. They might sort of believe it as a kind of back, a background variable, but they're not like, we need to police the world. They don't think that. And so I do think there's a huge conflict here between the people that voted Biden into office and the kind of self-conception of the Democratic Party elite. And that's going to cause major problems. Okay. And I, I do think now in US politics, you have sort of three bases, and you do. You have a very conspicuous strong left, which isn't really reflected in the Democratic Party. It's not really reflected in the media, but it's clearly there when you see opinion poll data on various policies. It's there in Florida where Trump wins, but you see backing up a $15 minimum wage. Then you've got the center. It's kind of desiccated. We don't know how weak it is. Right now, it does look like uh, you know, it, it feels like a sort of necromancied corpse. It's the undead, right? We don't know how big or how small it is. It's, but it, it, it's definitely in charge for now. And then you've got the Republican right. And again, that's in a process of kind of splintering. And you can see a situation in four years time where you have a sort of Trump party, you know, going uh, for the White House. Would it win? No, almost certainly not. That would cause huge rifts within the Republican Party. But then, of course, you have your own fractures within the Democrats as well. So it is very volatile. And, and you know, I think America could be a profoundly different country by 2030 than the one it is today. And I do think it's a morbid symptom of the post-2008 crisis that the very man who was the vice president in the teeth of the global financial crisis of 2008, the very same man has now been elected president which tells you there's a dramatic shortcoming on the behalf of the American political class to solve the country's problems. This is, this is the definition of a sticking plaster. So it's great Trump has gone. It's fantastic that I don't think there was a coup attempt, but it was kind of similar to the, the beer hall putsch in the 20s in Bavaria. It's great that failed. Uh, and, and it's clear that there are anti-Trump sort of forces in American society, which are number pro-Trump forces. That's great. It's very welcome, but it's most certainly not the final word. I want to go to another Biden clip now, um, which is not so much about what he wants to do, but how he's planning to do it. Um, so once again, this has been a sort of unifying theme of Biden and Biden's candidacy and and since he's since he's won, um, which is that he wants to bring people together and work across political divides. We must end this uncivil war that pits red against blue. Rural versus urban or, or rural versus urban conservative versus liberal. We can do this if we open our souls instead of hardening our hearts, if we show a little tolerance and humility, and if we're willing to stand in the other person's shoes, as my mom would say, just for a moment, stand in their shoes. Now, I mean, there he's talking about, you know, wider society. That's a message to America. But it also kind of encapsulates his... Um, sort of ideas about the partisan divides at the elite level. So he's often suggesting, oh, I think I can win over Republicans. And my question for you, Nomi, is because this might seem, you know, some have argued, and I think it's quite persuasive, that because of the skewed nature of the American electoral system, especially the Senate, this might be one of the last chances the Democrats have to actually change the rules of the game to make them more fair. Um, so there'll be Senate elections in, in two years' time in many states which are expected to flip Republican, not because of the popularities of popularity of the Republican Party but because of the, the skewed electoral geography of mm -hmm. the United States. And do you think that instead of sort of saying, let's work together, Biden should say, look, this is, we've got two years now, the Democrats control all the houses and the presidency. I'm going to have an iron discipline for every Democrat lawmaker. And we are going to, um, you know, make DC into a state, make Puerto Rico into a state and make sure that we never have uh, a president like Donald Trump who hasn't won the popular vote and sort of a minoritarian Republican Party who still gets a veto in the Senate. Should he be saying, let's play hardball now, screw the Republicans? Oh, he should absolutely be saying, let's play hardball. Um, it's interesting that, that 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 part of the clip reminded me so much of the there's no red red America, there's no blue America, there's one America speech. Uh, I'm, 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 you know, not accurate quote, but the Obama speech, of course, about unifying America. And that speech came out of a convention uh, a few years before. President Obama, who's then uh, the nominee, not even the nominee at the time, I mean, he was a senator out of, out of Illinois. So we've had these divides for a long time. Um, and it is because exactly what you said, we have uh, these institutional issues 
uh, that have exacerbated over time as as uh, gerrymandering as uh, has has been the tool for Republicans as Republicans have taken over state legislatures and carved uh, congressional districts and frankly Democrats have worked with them to protect their districts as well uh, as the filibuster has been used to ad nauseum uh, by Republicans to hold up everything that could potentially be put uh, on the floor I think there is real movement uh, to end the filibuster I think there I think Senator Schumer, probably is more willing to play hardball, even though there's this this supposed, you know, partnership deal that they're going to do. I think that might, I'm hoping that that's just a maneuver uh, to get Mitch McConnell to work with him because the alternative is they just shove through everything that they possibly can. Um, you know, the good side of this is when it comes to the big issues that are going to solve the core crises right now that we're facing, the immediate and core crises, the economic inequality, the healthcare crises, it's uh, the housing crises in our country, that can come from the executive level. Much of that can come from the executive level. So, you know, Biden has declared that he's going to uh, immediately sign today over 100 executive actions, which is pretty bold, uh, but also this is the moment to do so. Simultaneously, this is where Senator Schumer needs to play hardball because there are some things that he can do and he can push for, uh, like like taking on the filibuster. But there are other things that, you know, whether it's uh, ending the Electoral College, you know, unfortunately, that's not unanimous in the Democratic Party. Uh, it's it's It was built off of a racist mindset uh, to disempower, you know, because we were, we still, we we're a country that came out of slavery. Our entire, we are a capitalist country that was built off the backs of slaves, where slaves came in through the port right in front of Wall Street, and New York City still had slaves while the rest of the North didn't. So we are a country's, our model was built off of that. And as a result, so are forms of government. Um, DC statehood, I think, is a go. I think Puerto Rico is a little bit more complicated. It's, it's traditionally a more conservative issue on the island. So sometimes Democrats lump that in, but uh, Puerto Rico is treated as if it's a colony, but I think, um, you know, having done a lot of work in Puerto Rico, there is a real movement and a growing independence movement that was was killed, uh, you know, 50 years ago by the state, uh, meaning the American state, uh, the, the federal state. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, it would help to have more senators. Um, I think that we could probably keep the Senate. The Congress is what we have to worry about. We lost so many seats this cycle, which is not great when you have a presidential year. And usually, whoever is a sitting president will lose seats uh, in the off year. Hopefully it's not a shellacking like it was under Obama. And hopefully, you know, simultaneously, uh, President Biden really pushes for the DNC to put the money back into state parties. Because how can you take on gerrymandering when you're not winning state legislatures? There are plenty of state legislatures that we could be winning in if we just had Democrats putting money into parties to recruit talent, to recruit uh, candidates, to recruit staff, to actually be strategic and fight these Republicans instead of every Democratic candidate for themselves, which is really not how you win and it's not how you play the long game. Because right now, what Republicans are trying to do is through the state legislative uh, legislatures that they, they they control, even with d Democratic governors, they're trying to ram through electoral reforms, retroactive reforms, I should say, from their minds that it's a reform, to make it so that they hold control for another 10, 15, 20 years, even though, as Aaron said, demographics are against them. They're playing the long game. Democrats are playing the short game, partly because the Democratic Party is so deeply invested and making money off of presidential elections and these big Senate races and not on winning for the long, long term.